Let's go over how to use a CNC router to machine out aerospace grade mold patterns for making final production molds to make carbon fiber parts. Hey everyone, Keen with Dark Arrow. In today's video, I want to talk about part two of using a CNC router to machine out aerospace grade mold patterns. In part one, we talked about why we picked this router, some of the upgrades we made to it for making parts like this. If part one sounds interesting to you, I left a link in the description below. In today's video, I want to go into more details on how to machine out these mold patterns, how to do multi-section mold patterns, and some of the tips and tricks we've learned along the way. Now you might be wondering, why not just machine directly to the mold? This is possible and it is something we've done on smaller molds for the aircraft. However, those molds are made out of very robust materials like epoxy resin and carbon fiber. Those same materials don't lend themselves very well to being machined. They work really well in a production environment for pulling multiple parts, carbon fiber parts, off of them. When it comes to machining though, it's a lot trickier to machine that. That's where these mold patterns come into play. And just to let you know, mold patterns are also referred to as master molds or plugs. For simplicity's sake, I'll just refer to them as plugs from here on out. Plugs are made out of tooling board. Now, tooling board is designed to be machined. It's an industrial grade aerospace material. There are a couple of nice things about that. The first one, which is obvious, it's designed to be machined. The second one, which may not be as obvious, is that when you have your plug, you can now use it as a master copy for making more molds. If your mold gets damaged or you need to make another mold to ramp up production, you've got your master copy or your plug right here, ready to go. That's why we machine a plug first, then a mold, and then make our part. As a side note, there are a lot of different materials you can use other than tooling board and a lot of them that we've tried. There's MDF, there's low density foam off the shelf from your local hardware store, there's even 3D printing. Now, like I said, we've tried those, but they didn't fit the bill for the quality and long-term robustness that we wanted out of a plug. I don't want to spend too much of your time going over the details on why we like tooling board over some of those other materials that we've tried in the past, but I think it is worth mentioning or highlighting the top three. The first big one is dimensional stability. Tooling board is much better at staying the same size day to day, even if variables like temperature and humidity are changing in your shop. What we've seen with other materials like MDF is that as the humidity changes from day to day, the material can actually shrink and expand depending on what the humidity levels are. That doesn't happen as much in materials like tooling board. The second one is small part feature retention. And what I mean by that is that as you go smaller and smaller with your tool diameter, you can keep creating smaller and smaller features. You don't have a resolution loss like you would with a lower density foam or MDF or 3D printing. So what that's really helpful for is making edges that go all the way around that define where the edge of your part is. When you go to cut out your carbon fiber part from your mold, you actually have a feature all the way around that defines where the edge of your part is allowing you to cut your part out to the same dimensions every single time. The third and final one that I want to highlight really quick before we get into all the other details of machining this out is just the fact that this is engineered specifically for machining. So it machines really nice, creates really nice chips. It's a lot more enjoyable to machine than other materials like lower density foam or MDF. And once it comes off the router table and you're going to do some light sanding on it, it actually sands really nice too. If you've made it this far along in part two, you might actually be thinking back to part one where I went on and on about why we picked this economical three axis CNC router. But now I'm going on and on about why we paired it with this high dollar value aerospace grade tooling board for making plugs. Shouldn't you pair a high end router with high end materials? In an ideal world, yes. But if you're budget constrained to picking one or the other, I would argue that the materials matter far greater than the router itself. Let me explain with a simple analogy. 
So let's use the simple analogy of food, which I think everyone can relate to. For example, take Gordon Ramsay. You can put that guy in almost any kitchen and he can make a gourmet meal if you give him the right ingredients. If you try to do the opposite, put him in say a high-end kitchen with low-grade ingredients like a frozen pizza from Walgreens, you can't get a gourmet meal out of him. Same is true in this world. You need to start with the right materials first and then worry about your router second. If you try to do the opposite, you're never gonna get the gourmet result that you want. For example, if you take a five axis CNC high grade router and pair it with low grade materials like MDF, it's just not gonna be the same as if you start with the right materials first. So worry about your materials and then your router second. In an ideal world, you'd have both. One last thing to note about plug materials. When you're creating the plugs for an entire aircraft, they can start to get very large, very heavy, and very costly very quickly. Because of that, we use two different densities of tooling board to make every single one of our plugs. The lower density is used to make up the internal volume of the plug. It's nice because it keeps the weight down and it keeps the cost down of the plug. However, it can crumble and tear and get damaged a lot easier than the higher density. The higher density is what we use on the outside shell of our plugs. It's a lot more robust, a lot less susceptible to denting, and a lot less susceptible to damage as you're pulling the mold off of it. However, it is heavier and it is a little bit more costly. Therefore, we try to strike a balance between our low density and our high density tooling board materials when we're making all the plugs for the Dark Arrow One. All right. Enough going on about the plug material itself. Let's get into how to actually machine this material itself and how to make multi-section plugs like this cowling one that I have right here. Every single plug for the Dark Arrow One gets modeled in the computer world, including its stock. That way the router knows what it's going to machine. In order to create a CAD model of the plug, we first need to start with a CAD model of the carbon fiber part itself. With the part modeled, we can model a mold around that part and then add extra features to the mold, including where the edge of the part is and flanges. So we have somewhere to put our tacky tape, for example. Once you have the mold modeled, you can then create a negative of it, which represents the plug. And with the plug modeled, you can then model the stock for that plug. The way we model our stock is we add additional thickness to our plug and then we split our plug from top to bottom into different layers. Those layers represent the thicknesses of the tooling board that we receive. What you end up with are many different 2D sections of stock that we cut out on the router and then we bond together like a Lego set. You're left with a rough representation of your plug that you then machine out. This is a little bit time consuming up front However, you drastically cut down on the amount of tooling board you need for every single plug for the aircraft. Once you have your stock created, the next big thing is actually figuring out how you're going to secure it to your router table. So three big things there. You want it to not move in the middle of your machining operation. You want it to stay flat from one end to the other onto your table. And then the next big thing would be to make sure that whatever clamping method or securement method you use, it's not going to get in the way of your machining. The best approach we found for this for our setup was to actually bolt into every single plug from underneath. What that does is it ensures that it's absolutely not going to move in the middle of the machining operation. It means that it's not just locally flat in the areas that you clamp it. It's flat from one end to the other, including the middle. And then the last big thing is that it means that it's not going to get in the way of your tool paths when you're machining out your plug. While we're on the topic of tool paths, I should also note that planning out your tool path strategy is equally important. When you're transitioning direction from say X positive to X negative, if you're running a parallel tool path, that transition from X positive to X negative results in relative motion in the head of your router. The end mill itself can actually dip below the surface of your feature geometry. So what's important there is if possible, Try to plan your transitions of your tool path directional changes off your part. Every plug requires you to mount it to the table and to rough machine it and then finish machine it. There are multiple hours that go into making a single plug. 
but the majority of the hours are spent doing the finishing machining. So our strategy when we got larger sections on our router table was to mount it to the table, do the roughing operations, and then hit go on the finishing operations before we headed out for the day. That way those finishing operations could run in the middle of the night when we were home. When you come back in the morning, it would be completed. We could take it off the table and repeat that process. If we were to run the finishing machining during the day, we wouldn't be able to take advantage of those nighttime hours to do the finishing machining. At some point, when you're creating plugs for an aircraft, you're gonna inevitably want to create plugs that exceed the volume capabilities of your router. And your biggest challenge there becomes avoiding tolerance stack up. Now, I'm not gonna give away all our secrets on how we do that with our multi-section plugs, but I can provide you with some general guidelines that should help you out. When making multi-section plugs, try to avoid multiple different mating faces. That can be a little bit tricky when it comes to something like this cowling, for example. This is probably our worst offender of that. But for every other multi-section plug that we made, in general, it just had a common bottom datum plane, which was the face that met up with the router table. And then for each section that made it up, it had one mating face. Limiting the number of faces that need to match up means that you can limit the amount of tolerance stack up when piecing those sections together. The last piece of advice that I want to give you about avoiding tolerance stack up when machining multi-section plugs is try to machine the mating faces in the same general area of the router table. That way, if you have tolerance differences from one end of the router table to the other end of the router table, you're not including those tolerance stack ups into your multi-section plug itself. All right, guys, that wraps up part two of using a CNC router to machine out aerospace grade mold patterns. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. We'll catch you in the next video.